I'm Dr. Dave Layton, and welcome to a study about two men that we can actually describe as unsung heroes. Unsung means we just don't do much about singing their praises or telling a lot about them, and yet we're going to find out that these two men are not only worthy of our praise, but we can learn from them quite a bit. I'm going to be talking about Matthias and Justice. We find out about these two men in Acts chapter 1. These two men were being considered as a replacement for Judas, and we will look at that here in a few minutes. We're going to talk about both of these men and what we can learn from them. So let's turn now to Acts chapter 1 and talk about uh, who these men were, uh, the, the situation that came about that uh, causes us to look at these two men. And then, of course, we'll talk about what we can learn from them. In Acts chapter 1, we find uh, the mention of a man named Matthias. Now, interestingly, this is the only mention of Matthias. Uh, we meet Matthias after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. There were about 120 disciples. They were all gathered together, including the 11 remaining apostles. They were gathered in Jerusalem for the fellowship, prayer. They were awaiting Jesus' promise of the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter, knowing the scriptures, uh, he knew the scriptures were going to be fulfilled. He proposed that another man be chosen to take Judas Iscariot's place among the 12, to maintain their number. Now, the number 12, of course, was the number of the apostles that Jesus had originally selected. And we know the story of Judas Iscariot, how he betrayed our Lord, that led to the capture, the arrest of our Lord, and ultimately the crucifixion. All of that prophesied in history. And so we had then to, or they had to find a way to replace Judas Iscariot. Uh, Peter based his suggestion actually on Psalm 109, verse 8, that says, May another take his place of leadership. And also Psalm 69, verse 25, May their place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in their tents. Psalm 69, verse 25 is an interesting verse, and, and you may look at it and say, I don't understand how that's prophesying or leading up to this decision about someone to take Judas Iscariot's place. What scholars think about uh, that, that this verse of Scripture is referring to is to make certain that when the apostles do select someone to take Judas's place, uh, that there is someone that is not like Judas, so that his place, his persona, who he is, is going to remain vacant. Instead, they're going to replace him with somebody qualified or Peter puts forth a list of qualifications. They must be followers of Jesus from the beginning, uh, from John's baptism, unto the accession of Christ. So it's somebody who uh, has been with uh, the apostles and with Christ for the entirety of the ministry. Now, this person may not have been with the apostles and Jesus at every moment, because we know sometimes Jesus went away by himself, sometimes he went away with the apostles but he was a part of the ministry from the baptism of John until the ascension of Christ. That denotes, of course, an element of faithfulness. It, uh, it tells us that our, this individual would know the teachings of Christ, and he would know Christ. And so it was important that whoever is selected to be an apostle is somebody who's been with them all this time. And it would be somebody that the apostles would know as well. And so two men are put forward, uh, Matthias, who we'll look at first, but then a, another man called Joseph. And I really want to talk some in a few minutes about this guy named Joseph, because he's, he's a very interesting person and somebody I think that we identify with quite often. Uh, Joseph, in some uh, versions of scripture, is known as Justice and Barsabbas. And so these two men, Matthew, or excuse me, Matthias, and I like to call him Justice, uh, these two men were selected to be considered. And, and so there's no mention of uh, these two men uh, necessarily throughout 
the rest of the book of Acts. We do have Matthias in Acts chapter 1, and that's pretty much it. And we're going to look at justice. There seems to be another mention of him later on. So scripture just doesn't give us much information about these two men other than what I just mentioned. But based on Peter's statement of qualifications and their selection, it's obvious that they had been faithful disciples of Jesus through the entirety of the ministry. And so after praying together, the disciples cast lots to discern who the chosen man would be, and the lot fell on Matthias. Now, we don't know what a lot is. It's a method of of eliminating all the others down to one single choice. And a point of note here, by the way, this is the last time that there's any mention in Scripture uh, moving forward of the casting of lots. Uh, from here on out, they would be directly guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, a lot of scholars certainly think that the Holy Spirit was selecting the uh, uh, Matthias anyway through the casting of lots. But nothing is mentioned about Matthias beyond this point. Now, I want to change just a little bit. I want to talk about justice. Justice is actually one of my favorite men in Scripture because, again, it's somebody that I think a lot of us can identify with for some very positive qualities. Uh, what we know about justice specifically is he was not chosen, and, and that's nothing about him, his qualifications, because although not chosen, he did meet the qualifications that Peter put forward. He had a servant heart. He was willing to serve. He was ready to serve. Uh, there's no record in Scripture of any hostility or bad feelings or uh, being angry because he was not selected. Uh, indications are that he continued to serve in whatever capacity God needed him to serve in. I want to call your attention to Acts chapter 15, verse 22. Uh, we see here that Joseph, or Justice, uh, they, their variations of the same name, was mentioned in the men who would go with Paul to spread the good news that Gentiles would be allowed into the kingdom of God upon their repentance and baptism. And so we see that Justice was in Jerusalem and very active in the church. He was part of the Jerusalem council. So even though he was not selected to be an apostle, he nonetheless continued to serve our Lord. And that is such an important message for us. Not all of us can serve in leadership positions, but all of us can serve in different ways. And so Justice is a wonderful example of that. We all serve in different capacities. Uh, all the roles that we fulfill in the church are important. All of them are about serving the Lord, serving the church. So given that uh, this is the only mention of Matthias, it would seem that there's little we can learn, or even uh, very much about justice. There, there seems to be little we can learn. Both men were silent but effective in their service to the Lord. But what are some things that we can look at from these men and draw uh, from their example? What are some things we can learn from these two men? Well, one is to be faithful. Uh, we see clearly that Matthias and Justice, the two men that were put forward in this decision, were faithful. They had been with Jesus and the others throughout the entirety of the three years that he was in his ministry. Uh, they had been with Jesus for the whole time. That would require faithfulness. Uh, that's our lesson. We first dedicate our life to him, and then we commit to faithful living. We must be faithful. Our, our Lord does not demand perfection from us, but he does demand faithfulness, and that's what we'll be rewarded in heaven for. We'll be rewarded for our faithfulness to the Lord. Faith always comes first, but it's faith in action. That's faithful living. A second lesson that we can learn from this is not only to be faithful, but also to be ready to serve. And ready means preparation. Preparation in your, in, in, in your uh, spirit, in your heart. Preparation in your knowledge about uh, our Lord and the will of our Lord. But also preparation in your abilities. What can we bring to the church? 
uh, whatever talents or knowledge or skills that we might have, we look at it and say, how can I use these in the Lord's service? Or how can I learn something that can be used in the Lord's service? So we be ready to serve. Being ready is closely tied to being faithful. Later on, when Paul put forward the qualifications for elders and deacons, men who would serve in the Lord, it is noted that they must be tested. In other words, they're ready to serve. They have been serving all along. And so although the biblical record on, on uh, uh, justice and on Matthias doesn't always state uh, that it uh, doesn't show us what they were prepared to do, they nevertheless were faithful and were ready to serve. The third thing that we can learn from all of this, and, and again, we're talking about being faithful, being ready to serve, is talking about the idea of serving. We serve on God's time. God selects us to serve. When we submit to him, we obey uh, what the Lord wants us to do by repenting and, and uh, uh, being baptized and seeking to serve. Uh, our Lord then is going to give us wonderful opportunities to serve. But the way in which we serve and, and the timeline of our service is, is really based on the Lord. I think about over my life as I've uh, grown in skills and knowledge, uh, I, I would be doing something that it would be a thought of, oh, I wish I'd been doing this all along. And yet I couldn't have been doing it all along because I had to gain knowledge and experience. And that's true also in service to the Lord. For example, we think about our elders, our leaders within our congregations. Uh, these are men who are mature in mind, mature in their attitude, and also mature in their abilities to serve. And that takes sometimes a very uh, long time, almost a lifetime, of, of preparation. And so it's already been stated that our role is to be faithful and ready to serve because God will present us with opportunities. We can try as we might to move ahead in our service to, to fit our timetable, but that doesn't always work out that way. I've often wished that uh, what I could do now, I would have been able to do before, but we serve on God's time not ours. We have to remember that. God takes an eternal view, and he knows the future. He knows what's good for us. He knows our abilities, and he knows how we can best serve in the kingdom. And so the opportunity to serve will always be there, and we can look and do things, many different things, that are of service, of value to the Lord, to the church, as, as we continue to be a member of the Lord's kingdom. So not everyone serves in selected positions or uh, will receive some high award or recognition. In fact, the vast majority of us, we just work in the Lord's kingdom doing what we can. But it's important to note that we don't want praises from men. We want to hear on the day of judgment, well done, good and faithful servant. In other words, we're serving the Lord. He's the one that we serve. He's the master. We're the servant, and our role is to serve the Lord. Now, you can be doing great and wonderful things all the time. A lot of people do, and they're to be congratulated for that. They're to be noticed and honored for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But friends, really and truly, what's really important is that we're serving the Lord. And even though we may be doing good things that are mentioned in Scripture as worthy works, caring for the poor, caring for the sick, visiting people in prison, uh, any number of things that we find out there, unless we are a child of God, then we're really not doing it truly for the Lord's service. So the first thing we need to do to make our service count is that we have to be in the kingdom. Notice. Matthias and Justice in our lesson had been followers of Christ from the beginning. And so it's important that we be followers of Christ and not just in name. We don't just declare ourselves to be a Christian. 
We have to do what the Lord says to do. And that means we have to recognize who Jesus is as our Lord and Savior. That's confessing who he is. And we have to repent. That means we have to change from uh, our will to the will of our Lord. We change our focus from self to changing our focus on our Lord. Now, repentance involves also turning away from our previous life and using that life to serve our Lord. So there's that confessing part. There's that repenting part. But that's not enough. We need to act upon our faith. And that means that we're going to be baptized by immersion. And at that point, when we come up out of that water, we're in the kingdom. We are children of God. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And then we look at our life, and we live every day to the best of our ability to follow the teachings of Christ. That's that faithful part. And we look for opportunities to serve our Lord. Everything we do as we grow and mature, we learn that everything we do is dedicated to the service of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, friends, thank you for joining me in this lesson. And I hope that if you have not submitted to our Lord's will by that repentance and baptism, that you'll look to do so. And if you have submitted to the Lord, but for some reason you kind of wandered away and maybe turned back into the world, that you'll repent again, turn back to the Lord. Friends, thank you again very much for joining me in this Bible study. And in all things, we give God the glory. Thank you.